it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The sun is not a star by James Caligo. The sun is not a star. That's what I heard my father say in a fit of fear once. I was 12 years old when he came back from working at NASA. He retired and had started working on solar panels instead, but always hated working on sunny days. He wasn't warm or even remotely acknowledging of me or my mom anymore. He looked at us as if we were ghosts the entire time that he was with us. Something that still gives me a chill to this day. Before his retirement, he used to be more of a family man. He kissed my mom, gave me a warm hug, and was overall a proper father towards me and my little sister. He always seemed like he loved his job. The pay was good, and he'd always bring me some parts of a scrap project he'd be working on. Life seemed rather routine, but peaceful and beautiful even. I thought I was way luckier than any of my friends whose parents weren't always as successful. Before retirement, my dad would have pictures of him on the International Space Station, space shuttles before they were phased out, controlling a rover that was meant for Mars at some point, and even meeting one of the presidents of the United States. He was an excellent astronaut, and I remember during one of his many visits from high-ranking officials in government that the man had said to him that he was one of the best. I wasn't really sure who this person was, but he had a strange symbol on one of his badges. From what I could tell, it like a shield with six eagle wings coming out in pairs of three on each side. Well, after this meeting, and that's when everything changed. I didn't see my dad for six months. But when he returned and retired, he never had any more interest in outer space. He'd stare up at the night sky and almost look like he wanted to curse at it. He dreaded every day when the sun would rise after having a hard time sleeping every night. One day I decided to tell him that I wanted to be an astronaut like he was. And his response was rather surprising and demoralizing on top of that. Now listen, Hayden, I want you to promise that you won't follow in my footsteps. There's nothing good about outer space, and there's nothing especially good about the sun. Well, he clearly wasn't fond anymore about the idea of space travel. I resented him for what he said to me that day. For years, though, his health had been deteriorating, and mentally he was becoming more unstable and would frequently have nightmares, screaming in the middle of the night and saying things like, It's not a star, and Nexus Gates. Well, to me, this sounded like unreasonable gibberish. That was always something that puzzled me and made me wonder what exactly it was that Dad had experienced during his time at NASA. But finally, he had to be put into a mental home, his mind completely losing it and spilling out into senseless repeats of some unexplainable event that was incoherent and absurd. On one particular Friday afternoon, Mom and I were cleaning out Dad's stuff and I happened to come across his journal in his briefcase that he'd left open by mistake, probably. I wasn't even aware that he'd had one, so I opened it up and started taking a look at what he'd written down. Well, there were some more absurd pictures that he had clipped inside it. There were astronauts that I'd never seen, and we had quite a few of them visit our home. And we'd had quite a few of them visit our home. There was also him with a team of five others that I couldn't identify. Behind them was a large facility, futuristic in design. It looked like he was on the set of a science fiction or space exploration TV show from the 80s. Well, that's probably an exaggeration, but you get the point. It looked out of this world. He wrote down a lot of stuff, but most of the pages were just recollections of his many exploits that had to do with previous missions that I was already aware of. It wasn't until I got near the end of the journal that the last few pages had a different take. Yeah, they were more detailed, and the content was not what I was prepared to learn about. Project Light hand. I found this to be an unusual name, started looking through his notes of what it was all about, and instead I believe I'd discovered what had caused my father's mental instability, and I'm not sure I should be sharing it with others now. But, well, if you're willing, here 
was his story. February 17th, 2017. Things are going great. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, and we should be arriving on the moon in about 10 minutes. I couldn't believe I got picked by the Protectorate organization as a moonwalker. I wasn't even aware that they were still doing moon missions. Uh, hopefully one day I can tell my son Hayden about this one. Unfortunately, though, they still have me sign that non-disclosure agreement, so I'll have to keep this one under wraps for a few decades. I've docked now, and I'm ready to meet the team that I'm going to be working with. About 43 other people are working on this moon base. We're supposed to keep an eye out for UFOs. Well, at first I thought they were kidding, but the director of the base, called Dr. John Valley, told us that UFO doesn't mean aliens, although he did say that we shouldn't rule out that as a possibility. Personally, I thought I was learning things a little too fast, but after my association with some of the other crew, I was becoming a little more informed about our place in the universe. At least, I was learning about our general knowledge of the solar system. February 19th, 2017 I was in the mess hall and four other guys were sitting at a table. They invited me over and one of them, his name was Damien, was spouting about some nonsense that went down about four years ago. So, uh, yeah, here's a fun story. My friend who works with the Protector of Military Branch on Earth told me that they had to deal with some nasty beast that had crash-landed in the woods somewhere. It was wiping out all the people in the surrounding area, and they had to hit that thing with flamethrowers and missiles for over a day until it destroyed one cabin and, get this, the couple that was inside that cabin was armed to the teeth and managed to get the final shots in. I'm telling you, it's rather embarrassing that civilians were able to get the wind from under those guys. I wondered about what this beast was, growing more curious about what else they knew. But there were some dismissals of his claim and the conversation changed into introductions. So, uh, where are you guys from? Damien asked. A few spoke of various places, Kansas, Egypt, and one from Vietnam, which I was a little surprised to hear. But one guy replied, I'm not entirely sure. My memories are foggy, but I believe I came from overseas. Well, everyone looked at him like he was crazy, except for Damien. He suddenly came up with a theory. Oh, yeah, I heard some scientists talking about this one. Despite his overdramatic mannerisms, everyone sat at attention because he seemed to have a lot of inside information. The Vietnamese guy said, Well, go on. Okay, so I'm assuming you guys have heard of that similar thing called the Mandela Effect, right? Everyone in the group rolled their eyes. Well, except for our mystery man. He seemed a little more interested. I, for one, didn't care too much, so I quit paying attention and couldn't recall anything else that was spoken of then. February 27th. Now was the day of our experiment. It was February 27th, and one of our fellow astronauts, as well as scientists, was about to do a spacewalk, or as we like to call them, moonwalkers. Her name was Judy, and she was definitely a cute one. She reminded me a lot of my wife based on her behavior and the way she got flustered by every little inconvenience. We mostly tolerated her, even if she had that tendency to blame us for some of those inconveniences. She was taking one of the lunar roving vehicles quite far from the base. We'd been receiving reports that there was a strange power surge in that area. The Apollo missions had discovered it long ago but was unable to find its location. Now things have changed, and our technology has improved. And from what I've heard, it's improved even more so than I'd formerly believed. We watched on the monitors as her cameras recorded everything. She was approaching a large lunar cliff face, a steep 90 degree rise, and in front of her was a large white marble platform. It had a circular design, with a row of pillars holding up the top of the cliff from the inside. In the center of it was an obelisk, with strange symbols of unknown origin carved into each side. Judy the base, are you guys seeing this? She radioed. I was watching in confused amazement. Never in my mind did I expect to see something so human-built on the moon. Ancient humans on top of that. 
but there was something that caught my eye. There was a small carved out section near the base of the obelisk. A statue sat inside. I told the director about it and he relayed what I'd said to her. She walked towards it, reaching down and pulled it out. When she took a look at it, everyone in the room couldn't quite make out what it was. I mean, it was abstract and every time you thought you were just about to figure out what it was, it would somehow change shape again. Well, I guess I'll be heading back. She turned around, and when she got back to the lunar rover, there was a sudden flash from behind her that caught everyone's attention. She turned around, but saw that nothing had changed with the monument. March 7th, 2017. We're finally going to see what the solar base is going to do tomorrow. Well, I have to admit, Project Lighthand is going to be amazing. Judy and Damien were explaining it to me that it would allow us to have infinite energy from the sun. They explained to me how there's a space station that orbits near the sun. I thought that was insane. I mean, the heat and radiation should have killed everyone there. But they assured me everything was automated by a series of robots that are controlled from here. They showed me some footage of the space station kept in an orbit on the other side of the sun, so that no one from Earth can spot it. Oh, smart, but I honestly couldn't tell you who'd be wanting to know about it anyway. What the project is supposed to accomplish is that it will fire a beam down into the sun that will rip open a temporal portal that can be contained inside a massive reactor on board the space station. Thus, we won't have to rely on nuclear, solar, wind or fossil fuels ever again. A large portal into the sun will generate endless heat for the next billions of years. I didn't know we'd perfected the wormhole technology, I said. Damien laughed and said, Ah, oh, dude, they got that thing in the bag like 20 years ago. Remember when I said about my buddy who had to fight aliens on Earth? You really think that technology hasn't been exploited by us? Judy rolled her eyes and said, First off, you shouldn't be telling everyone about what's going on in the military branch of our organization. You can get in trouble, Damien. Ah, big deal. The director's been in the rooms where I was telling some of the others about all the weirdness that goes on back home. Yeah, but you signed the non-disclosure. Oh, don't try and use that in this argument. Oh, that only applies when we get back to our normal lives. I'll say whatever I want while I'm up here. But we're literally on a moon base. I enjoyed their conversations. They were such a comedic duo with each other, and I felt like maybe there was a bit of romantic tension between them. But I still couldn't wait for the project tomorrow. March 18th. We were excited about the new project about to commence. Everyone was in the control room, staring at the dozens of screens on the wall and desks. There was an anxiety that I believe we all shared. The fear that something might go wrong, or perhaps the entire loss of the space station itself would set us back a dozen years. I stuck close to my two friends that I'd made, Judy and Damien, and we watched as a nearby satellite was recording the station from the outside. And that's when the director told everyone to be quiet and watch. The countdown had begun. My thoughts were to going back home and how this was going to be a revolutionary moment for everyone on Earth. The idea that my kids would look at me and know that I was there when this history was being made was a heart-racing moment. Damien was getting rather uppity about the whole thing. He insisted that this test should have been experimented on Jupiter first. He was worried that the reactor wouldn't be strong enough to hold the energy and that we were risking the solar station's survival during this project. Yeah, don't worry about it, man, I said. If the station is destroyed, nobody loses their lives, and it's just the government's money that's wasted. Well, he gave me a deadpan glare and said, Yeah, my tax money burning up right before my eyes. Well, Judy and I paid him no more attention, and we watched on the monitor as the countdown was nearing its end. Three, two, one. 
A beam of energy was shot down into the filtered light of the sun, digging deep into its surface. We were all standing with astonishment, happy that the first part of the operation was going smoothly. Judy smiled at me. I did the same, as this was a monumental moment in human history. With energy from the sun, we could have enough power to travel all the way to the next star system. That's when Damien rolled his eyes at everyone else's cheering, and I saw that his face suddenly lit up when he took another look at the screen. There was another eruption of murmuring coming from those who were near the front, and Judy and I turned back. The colour of the room had also changed from bright yellow to a sudden mixture of crimson red and Egyptian blue colouring. Well, I couldn't process what I was looking at. This was unorthodox and completely insane. The sun was changing to a different colour. The surface of it was blue, deep and malevolent. Surrounding it was a hue of energy that was red in colour. Well, the whole thing made the sun look like a menacing abomination as it pulsed with waves of energy outwards. Everyone looked in shock and horror as they saw the entire space station that was orbiting above the sun get torn to shreds and disintegrate into molten shards of metal in outer space. For a brief moment, I thought about how Damien was right. Then I realized that what was happening was far worse than any of us could understand. Alarms started going off all around the base. Unfortunately, there wasn't much for any of us to do, since this was well out of our area of expertise. But then the satellite caught something else. What we were seeing was happening in real time. Thanks to the wormhole technology that had been appropriately named space-time drilling, we were able to transport a lot of our small-scale fleets to areas within our solar system. Everything from satellites, space stations, and radio transmissions. I wasn't completely sure how they achieved this, but all I can guess is that the alien technology probably had something to do with that. But what the sun did next was that it shot out a concentrated beam of energy from a singular point on its surface, firing at a tremendous speed that was equivalent to a flash of light. A long streak came from the surface and was heading out into outer space. By this point, the director was already getting in contact with Command on Earth. I left the room with Judy and Damien, and we ran out to the observatory section of the base, wanting to see the change in the sun's surface when the light finally reached us. We had about one minute left by the time we reached the observatory and stood next to each other, alongside at least a dozen more people who were in the room. Perhaps we all wanted to see this with our own eyes. I watched as the beautiful white light that came from the sun started to dim and became that vile, dark blue light. I could only imagine what my family and friends on Earth were thinking when the sun suddenly changed colour. This isn't going to end well. I can only imagine how this will impact photosynthesis, Judy assumed. Well, I wouldn't think about that. Just imagine how fast society will crumble with this change. I then stood there in contemplative silence. My mind was still reeling over what had transpired and I kept wondering how this could have happened. What did we do that would cause the sun to change? I guess it wouldn't matter because everyone in the room started shouting and panicking and their fingers pointed up toward the sun. Judy shook my shoulder and I came out of my trance. My eyes stretched out from shock as I saw a gigantic beam of energy supercharged and as bright as the sun was before, coming straight towards the earth. No, oh dear God, no, I panicked. That's when there was a massive flash of energy and a vibration that rippled through the base. No one could look up and the few people who saw it happen started screaming out that they couldn't see anymore. I saw my skeleton through my hands, even though I had my eyes closed on top of that. It must have been tremendously bright to have been able to accomplish that. But after a few seconds had passed, the light had died down and I was able to look back out into space to see what had transpired. My heart sank and I fell into despair. 
I watched as an entire molten material was firing off into all directions from where the Earth once was. The Earth. Everyone on it. It was all gone. I'm not too sure what exactly played out outside of my field of vision. I became so distraught that I was having flashbacks of my own life. Typically this was associated with someone who was about to die. Or perhaps I felt that I had died. Memories of my wife opening the door, our son and newborn daughter waving to see me as I walked up towards our beautiful house. That thought alone, that they'd have been instantly vaporized, was so distressful that I must have shut down emotionally for quite some time. Judy and Damien were shouting at each other about something that I wasn't paying attention to. But then they grabbed hold of me and led me along through the base towards the control room where the director was. Judy sprinted ahead of us and approached him first. Director, we have a really bad situation. It must have been hard for him to hear because there were a dozen monitors with men on them, dressed as captains, shouting and explaining to one another what had happened to Earth's command. The director replied, Listen, Judy, I'm trying to have a discussion with all of the other captains. Currently, there's too much panic going on throughout the chain of command and well, whatever it is, I already know about it. Earth is gone. And now every human that's currently off-world is the last of their kind. He turned his back on her and kept trying to tell the others to calm down. But there was still a great deal of distraught going through all of them. Judy, frustrated, stomped her way out of the room and Damien and I followed after. Damien attempted a moment of humor guess it was his way of coping. Are you sure were able to make yourself heard with all that stomping around? You'd think the low gravity would make that more difficult. Oh, shut it, Damien. I wanted to know more about something, but apparently the director has better things to do. Finally, my silence was broken when I heard her say that. I guess my curiosity had come back despite my shock and inability to process my loss. So, um... What exactly was it that you wanted to know? She stopped right outside the women's barracks, and then she turned around and said to the two of us, well, I wanted to know more about that monument. She then walked in and closed the door just as quickly. We weren't going to follow after her because, well, it's the women's room. I laid down on my bunk for a few hours. Damien was right below me doing something with his tablet. I kept replaying those moments. The sudden loss of my whole life, and now being trapped on the moon. On the earth. All of its beauty, all of its people. All gone in an instant. A flash of light, only to be atomized. My only hope was that it was quick, and no one had actually felt it. Bad news, Shay. Look at this. Damien held up his tab. It was a simulation of Earth and the Moon. Damien explained. If you notice, the Moon no longer has the gravity of the Earth to keep it in its orbit. So now we're being slingshot into outer space. Well, better than falling into the sun, don't you think? I said. Yeah, but... Well, I don't know, man. It's going to get really bad here. We only have enough food to last us a year. What about water? I asked. It's probably not going to be an issue. I mean, we get our water from the moon. There's plenty of ice on the surface. Well, of course, as we head further out, it's going to be a lot colder. We probably won't be able to use the lunar rovers anymore. So it doesn't matter then. We're all going to die. Well, it's not as bad as all those people on the space stations. They have less food than us. And they have to recycle all their water, but it's a limited supply. I'd say they'll probably last only about two months at the most. Without the wormhole technology leading us back to a habitable planet, the entire human race will go extinct within a year or two at the most. Jeez. Why did this happen to us? I mumbled. All we wanted was to find an even more efficient energy source than nuclear power. Well, the process of tearing open a wormhole took a lot out of the nuclear-powered engines of the space stations that we'd been building. 
Sure, they would last for a few decades, but eventually they had to be replenished, and that would require more time and money to be devoted to refueling instead of expanding outwards. Damien suddenly interrupted my thoughts and said, You know, I wonder what it was that Judy was up to. We should probably go see, don't you think? Well, considering the alternative of laying here in bed, well, I had nothing else to do. Both of us left the bunks and went over to the women's side. I knocked on the door, and it quickly slid open. There was a beetle-shaped redhead that answered the door. She spoke with a smoker's cough. What are you doing here? I ain't letting you in with all the women. Um, look, we just want to talk to our friend, Judy. Judy, well, she left about an hour ago. I think she said something about seeing the director. We thanked her for the information and ran to the director's office, seeing that that would be the likely area that he'd be in at the moment. We knocked on the door and heard a bit of shuffling from behind. Damien and I gave a brief glance at each other, wondering what it was that they were trying to hide in there. The automated door opened, and Judy was the one to answer us. I was the first one to speak. Judy, we want to know what's going on with you. What aren't you telling us? I looked inside and saw that the director was sitting at his desk, staring out into the black void from his tiny oval-shaped window. I don't believe I'm at liberty to discuss this with you, she spoke, dropping a signal that she wanted us to leave. The director suddenly spoke up, turning around in his chair towards us. Oh, let him in. Nothing matters anymore anyway. She stood aside and the two of us walked in and approached our boss. His eyes were red and his face looked exhausted. His body, all of it, was hunched over his desk and he said, So, uh, take it, you want to know what's going on with Judy? Uh, ask away. We weren't expecting this invitation, but I said, Listen, I get that the earth is gone now, and we're not going to last much longer ourselves. Why do I get a distinct feeling that you two have been planning something? We are. How about you take a guess at what it is? I looked around the room, trying to see if they were leaving a clue for me to notice. Well, nothing looked too out of the ordinary. Mostly because the director loved to collect artifacts from other cultures. It's funny. This room probably housed some of the last fine china, African vases, and bottles of unopened Italian wine that looked like they'd been sealed in the 1920s. Damien was also looking around, but he was a little more focused on Judy. Now I was certain they had a thing for her, but, well, this probably wasn't the best time. Then I looked at the desk. On it was that statue that we'd found from that weird monument that we'd seen outside. Yeah, that's not supposed to be here, Director. I pointed it out. Ah, uh, clever. Uh, I think it's time that Judy and I let you two into our little secret. I looked at Judy. She remained quiet. We waited as he took a deep breath and said in a calm but serious tone, I'm not supposed to discuss this with you boys, but none of that matters anymore. This statue is a key to a form of technology that our organization has been trying to master, but it's often too damn unpredictable. What kind of technology is that? Damien asked. Nexus gates. <laughs> Nexus what? I said, baffled. They're called Nexus gates, or gateways, or points, depending on who you ask. Yeah, they're a mysterious technology that randomly appears in various areas around the world. Our organization has known about them for a long time, but how they operate has been difficult to replicate for our own uses. Well, um... How important are they? I asked. Our wormhole technology is only able to stretch us as far as the copper belt. We've only managed to create a small fleet that can survey our little dot in the galaxy. But these, oh, these Nexus gates are a big deal. Our wormhole is a child's play in comparison to them. I saw an open seat at the other end and swiftly sat myself down. I was definitely going to need it after what I heard next. Um, in what way? Wormholes are the basics, but these Nexus gates are capable of 
and this is just from myths and legends as well as first-hand accounts from those who've managed to activate them. Well, they're capable of interdimensional travel as well as an unusual side effect of time travel. They bend reality to their will and manipulate space-time with relative ease. And not a single human knows how to actively control one. Not any that we've met. Damien had the same shocked expression that I had. I asked, so there are other universes out there, and these gates are capable of teleporting us there. Judy intervened then in the conversation and said, yes, but don't think that any of those universes are like ours. Some of our most brilliant astrophysicists and metaphysicists have concluded that there's such a thing as infinite universes. Well, there may be an Earth just like ours, only still around. It's just a matter of finding one, which isn't an easy course. The director was slumped down in his chair and had his hands over his face. The distraught in the air hung heavy. Damien started laughing, spooking all of us into thinking he'd finally cracked. But instead he said, Guys, don't you remember? He said those Nexus gates are capable of time travel. I don't know why it didn't hit me before. If we could activate it and get it to help us to time travel back, then we could prevent this whole thing from happening. Uh, it's not that simple, Director Valley said. Nobody in our organization has ever managed to use any of them. There have been mishaps where they turn them on, but well, the technology is so advanced, even though these gateways are estimated to be hundreds of billions of years old, possibly trillions. Well... What's the statue for? I asked. Judy replied. Well, not every gate needs them, but it is said that some are powered by them. They function like a kind of key. Well, maybe we could... <sighs> Enough, the director shouted. Everyone stood quietly, watching him go through his emotional breakdown. He kept shaking his head and crying. Look, sir, with all due respect... I'd like to go home and see my wife and kids again, I affirmed. Oh, you'd die trying to go by the off chance that you'd be able to get a piece of technology that no one understands to work exactly how you wanted it to? He coldly glared at me then. Well, I glanced over to Judy, who looked like she was fully on board with my idea. And I turned towards Damien, who had the same expression. I looked back down at my superior looking down at a man stricken by despair over the loss of our homeworld. Well, should be staying in here to die. His eyes changed for a brief moment. I could almost see a spark of hope come back to him. But the worst timing ever dropped on us when everyone in the base started screaming. I too felt something enter inside my head, and everyone in the room was covering their ears and crying out in dreaded panic. A loud screeching sound, slowly morphing into a low growl with a voice so deep and filled with so much hate, it was a deafening experience even though it was just a telepathic voice. You stole from me. You do not own my soul. I will wipe you out and cleanse my domain. Pray to your gods and die. After all of that, the high-pitched ringing faded away and everyone in the room was visibly shaken. My hands were out of control and the director looked like he'd been foaming a little at the mouth. Damien was on the floor, his whole body shaking uncontrollably, and Judy was leaning against the bookcase on the right side of the room. Everybody had been unprepared for this intrusion, and that's when the insanity outside the room began. Exiting the office, all of the remaining staff were huddled in corners, screaming at the top of their lungs. One man had been trying to take a screwdriver and bash it through his head, right through the ear, no less. Some people were fighting and clawing at each other. Now, I will clarify, it wasn't everyone. I'd say that about out of our staff of 43 people, excluding myself, maybe 15 of them had started going insane. I turned back towards the director, and saw that he was still foaming at the mouth, his face laying down on the desk. I think it was safe to say that that number was now 16. Despite the hard time that all three of us were having to get moving faster, 
The shaking alone wasn't going to stop us. Judy was leading us ahead, taking us to the control room, where she started messing around with one of the consoles and looking at a monitor. Oh no, I didn't think it would do this, she muttered. Damien asked, What? All of the satellites near the sun have already started falling towards the surface. A few space stations that were in orbit around Mercury and Venus are reporting back. They say that the planets are falling towards the sun. I put two and two together and said, Which means that we're probably falling into it too. She understood what I said and looked at the console again before bringing up a nearby satellite to us. It was as I said. The moon was now moving back toward the sun. All of the planets were being pulled in at an astonishing speed. But this broke all the laws of physics. But then again, do those even matter anymore? Does anything really matter? Well, if the directory isn't capable of coming to a decision, I am. Shay? Damien? She turned to us, and I looked back at her, waiting for her to tell me exactly what I knew was coming next. I need to get you into a spacesuit. We're about to go find our Nexus gate. We quickly ran through the endless, identical hallways, running past the few people that were still out and about, but quite a few were trying to avoid those who descended into madness. Judy was explaining. We have to get down to one of our lunar roving vehicles. It's going to get really hot outside as we get closer to the sun, so we have to move quickly. They can only hold two of us, though. Which one of you wants to go with me? Before I could even get my hand up, Damien shut up and said, I will. I raised an eyebrow at him, but I wasn't about to fight him about this. If we could just go back in time, this whole mess would never have happened. That brings up a question. How are we going to prevent this? Judy, how are we supposed to stop them from going forward with the project in the past? I don't think they'll just take our word for it, even if it would be odd that a version of us had come from the future. She stopped in her tracks, realizing that we needed to provide proof. Damien and Shay, go to the data and records room. All the security cameras are there, and all of the footage from the satellites and space stations are transmitted to this base. Not to mention all of the data from the experiment is also available to us if we can get it onto a flash drive. She explained to us how to do it, and the two of us were off to get the information needed to prove our situation to our past selves. She would get the rover ready. Well, everything seemed to be going according to our plan when we reached the room. I started the downloading process and Damien kept watch. I guess now will be a good time for us to get our last words out since I wasn't going to go with them. Look, I uh, want you guys to know that I'm really glad I had you as friends, I said, smiling at him. Well, I know they told us not to get too attached to our co-workers, but I wasn't one to follow the rules very well, he chuckled. So, when you and Judy, if you and Judy can go back in time, you can ask her out. He scratched the back of his head and looked rather uncomfortable with my question. Hey now, not that I wasn't thinking about it, but like, um, listen, I'd rather stop this horrible timeline from continuing. I looked away, trying to hide a brief smile and shaking my head. And he's right, but I have faith that we'll make it happen. With the download nearly complete, it's a good job we had such huge storage space on those flash drives. One thing I want to say before you guys leave. Do you think changing the timeline is going to result in death anyway? He thought to himself for a moment, seemingly wondering if that was the case himself. But I couldn't tell you. Not so sure what the repercussions would be. But it sure beats falling into the sun and the earth getting destroyed. Finally, the download was complete, and I quickly put the flash drive in my pocket. But right as Damien opened the door, one of the co-workers who'd gone insane lunged at him at full force. Damien! I shouted instinctively, rushing to aid him as he tried to kick off the madman. The insane worker had gripped around his neck and kept lifting it up and bashing the back of Damien's head against the concrete flooring then proceeded to bite down into Damien's neck, and I saw blood trailing out, all while my friend was letting out a gut-wrenching scream 
as we both were struggling to get this psycho off of him. I quickly looked around for whatever I could use as a weapon, and I spotted a fire extinguisher nearby. I grabbed it and quickly ran back and bashed it in the back of the worker's head. Well, this only managed to anger him more. He turned back toward me, ready to pounce. I prepared myself, and when he tried to take the leap, he miscalculated, and I was able to thrust the fire extinguisher's butt end right into his face at full force. I had a crunch, and I realized that I may have crushed his nose. He fell back, wiping the blood off his face and feeling his now broken nose. With his back turned towards me, I threw the metal canister back down and kept hitting him in the head until I knew that he was dead. I dropped it when I saw that the man wasn't moving anymore and ran back to Damien, who looked dead himself. Before I could get up to go find Judy, he reached out to my arm and muttered, You go. Prevent this. I didn't want to leave him, but that's when the sirens and red lights started erupting throughout the base. We were now in the danger zone. I looked back down at my friend, and he had blood trickling down his smile. He gave me the thumbs up, and then passed out. Forced to abandon my friend, I bolted as fast as I could back towards the hangar bay, where we kept the rovers. There were a few guards on the base, and they were mostly taking care of the ones who hadn't gone insane already. When I made it to the hangar, I saw two spacesuits prepped. Judy was already inside one, and she looked shocked when she saw that I was the only one who'd shown up. Where's Damien? she asked, her expression fearful of what my answer might be. Look, we got attacked. He didn't make it. For a brief moment, both of us wanted to stop and go back to make sure that what I'd said was true. But time was now ticking down to the few minutes that we had left. She went back to the rover, and the hangar door slowly opened and revealed to us what had been happening on the surface this whole time. Jeez, let's hope these suits can handle the heat, I remarked. She pressed forward at full speed, and both of us were thrown back a little by the sudden motion. We hit the sand of the surface harder than we'd expected, but now we were heading out towards the direction of the gateway. Both of us had our radios on so we could talk to one another. When we get there, make sure that you have your suit's camera on, she ordered. I realized what she meant and saw the little camera built into the top of the helmet. I pressed the button, and we were both recording. Lord, how do I describe what the surface of the moon looks like when you're falling in towards a blue star? I looked up at the sky and I could see other planets that were being torn apart by its gravitational pull. We both had our solar visors down, allowing us to get a glimpse of what was happening to the other planets that were closest to the sun. Mercury was already gone, but Venus was already starting to break up and fall to the surface. Nearby, Jupiter happened to be within our line of sight. It was still pretty distant, but I could see a stream of gases being pulled off from its surface and falling in faster than the planet. A surreal sight that I never thought I'd see in my entire life. The surface of the moon was also starting to break as small rocks were starting to float up, and dust was being kicked up and thrown into the vacuum of space. The light outside must have been extraordinarily bright. Damn, I never thought I'd see the end of the solar system, I said. Well, Judy replied, Let's try to make sure it never happens to begin with. Well, I had to check our instruments to make sure that the rover would be able to hold out by the time we managed to reach the gateway. So far, radiation levels were starting to pick up, but the heat was something that I was more concerned about. Our suits were capable of handling radiation levels equivalent to the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, but it's the heat that we would really have to worry about. The typical suits used by astronauts at NASA were capable of surviving in temperatures ranging from minus 156 or 249 Fahrenheit to 121 Celsius or 250 Fahrenheit. But these are protectorate-issued deep space survival suits, capable of surviving temperatures of minus 240 Celsius or 498 Celsius. Pretty advanced stuff. 
but after about a 10 minute drive we spotted the monumental gateway standing defiantly to the impending doom that was about to completely eradicate the last vestige of evidence that there was ever a moon. I was taken aback, seemingly mesmerized by the surreal landscape as the surface was being lifted up and thrown into the furnace that was getting bigger with every passing minute. We must have been falling in at a colossal speed. The rover was having difficulty staying glued to the ground, showing us that the gravitational pull of the moon was starting to lose out. When I looked back at the sun, my heart sank when I saw that colossal solar flares were exploding out from its surface. They fired off into space, seemingly grabbing hold of all the planets and their moons. The speed at which they were able to move was staggeringly incomprehensible, making me question every notion of reality. What should have taken hours for them to reach out to those planets, it did in mere seconds. Unless, of course, it had done them a while ago, and we were only now seeing the light. I like to believe that that was the case. But there was no time left. One of the solar flares shot out from the sun's surface and grabbed hold of the moon itself, pulling us in even faster. Well, how do I know this? Well, the temperature was rising rapidly. We stopped right at the stairs leading up to the platform where the obelisk was located, right in the center, surrounded by its ring of pillars. We ran as fast as we could to the top, and Judy and I took a look at the statue in our hands. When we do this, we'll have to try our absolute hardest to prevent this future, she said. Well, I'm with you every step of the way. She finally slipped the statue into the small cavity near the base of the obelisk, believing that this would be all it would take. But nothing happened. Hey, um, why isn't it turning on? I questioned. Um, uh, uh, she stammered and started looking around, desperately wondering if maybe we did something wrong with the statue. I joined in and saw that the surface of the moon off in the distance was starting to vaporize instantly from the ever-expanding solar flare that was reaching out toward us. It was a small one, hooking onto every celestial body in the solar system. Come on, hurry up, Judy. She kept searching around and pulling out a small device from one of the many pockets built into the suit. She started taking pictures of the strange symbols that were carved into the pillars and obelisk. Hold on, I have to get this stuff translated. Perhaps they tell us how to activate it. Jeez, I have to find the right language first. I watched as the rover was starting to lift up and flip away, being drawn in towards the sun. Judy, I shouted anxiously. Hold on, hold on, right there, she said excitedly. I hovered near her, hoping to get a look at what it said. Well, she explained. It's some um, surprisingly ancient Sumerian. Thankfully, we have a database that can translate this. I urged her on. Yeah, yeah, look, that's cool. Now, tell us how to activate this thing. It says, To change your destination, dig deep within yourself and specifically choose your new domain, lest you travel beyond your land. I turned my head to her, raising an eyebrow and thinking that this had to be a prank. Well, she shook her head dismissively and clarified, Listen, it means you sincerely have to want to go somewhere else, and you have to be extremely specific about it in every detail. Which I can only guess means that if you miss any key details, it might just drop you off at any point in time or place. Well, that made much more sense, and we both turned back towards the obelisk. Judy was the first to put her hand on it, and I noticed that some of the symbols carved in it started to glow. Hey, I think it's working. Before I could finish, there was a flash of light and a huge pulse of energy that exploded from it. We were both thrown back, and with the gravitational pull weakening, I found myself weightless for a few moments before I landed on the sand. I looked up quickly and saw Judy crashing nearby, hitting a few rocks face first. I got to my feet as quickly as I could, but felt the horrible pain in my ribcage, but tried to ignore it as best I could. When I reached her, I turned her towards me, her visor was cracked, and I could see oxygen was leaking out. She looked like she was already starting to suffocate. She reached out and told me through the radio, 
Go. Go. Save humanity, Shay. A hand loosened its grip on my suit and she fell unconscious. There was nothing I could do to save her. But there was one thing I could do. I had to run. I looked back at the Nexus gate and saw that it was firing off a massive beam of green, blue and red light into the empty void of space. It was a spectacular sight to behold. I looked back at the other side and saw that a wave of superheated rock and plasma was stretching out towards me, reaching the moon base within seconds. I saw the whole building instantly melt into molten metal. Despite the pain I was feeling, despite the exhaustion from the despair that I'd experienced, I knew what I had to do. I had to give it my all. I had to bring back my family. I had to bring back my friends. Everyone was counting on me to restore everything, and so I charged forward. Reality seemed to slow down for me. The wave of energy that was coming from behind me, the beam of light shooting off into the stars. Well, I threw myself forward with no other goal in mind than to give everyone their lives back. It felt exhilarating, a flow of adrenaline that kept me going at this moment, reaching toward the stairs and beginning every painful step upwards. I didn't give up. I jumped forward with as much strength as I could muster and threw myself into the obelisk, placing my hands around it and whispering to myself, Take me back to save humanity. The swirling vortex of energy and green, blue and red light surrounded me as it created a breathtaking cascade of endless light. The entire moon was breaking apart in front of me and I wondered if maybe I'd done it wrong. But I had to have faith in what was in front of me and close my eyes hoping it would be quick. Hit with a bright light and weightlessness, I dropped abruptly back down to the ground. I laid on the floor, trying to catch my breath after experiencing all of that. I turned my head towards the open valley from where the band of flames had been approaching, only to see a white light of a star off in the distance. I saw the moon base right where it was, between the two hills beside it. My eyes widened, and I knew what had happened. I'd done it. I'd gone back in time and was given my chance. My heart was racing, and I quickly got to my feet. I knew now what I had to do. I had to bring this flash drive and myself as the proof I needed. Not much else could be said after what transpired when I got to the base. Sure, everyone was spooked by my presence alone, but then I showed the director all of the data that was collected from the future, and he said that he needed to make a few calls. I had to stay in quarantine for a few days, but almost everyone didn't think that I had anything contagious. I ended up reflecting a lot, wondering what would happen to me. After three days, I was allowed to walk around the place and interact with everyone, running into Damien, Judy, and most unnervingly, myself, had to be almost entirely something that slipped my mind when I came back to the past. He and I looked at each other, and a few people around us were wondering what would happen next. When our fingers touched each other, I felt an unusual vibration go through my body, like my insides were rippling and curling in on each other until, without warning, the other me flashed into a beam of light. It was so blinding that we all covered our eyes, but I felt a strange overlap in my memories. I felt his as well as all of mine. It was an odd sensation, but he was gone. No, I was gone. No, we were both cancelled out and merged together. I wondered if this was some sort of correction to the time stream. After that, I had to go and answer some questions. This was the first time that time travel had ever been accomplished so thoroughly. They debriefed me and wanted to know how we'd managed to activate the Nexus Gate. I wondered why they didn't know how to use them. It seemed so easy for me and Judy to get hours working. One of the agents who questioned me said that they knew about the Sumerian writings on the wall of the Nexus Gates, but return trips during experiments had been unsuccessful. Well, you can send a person in, but you can't get them back out. I reminded them that I was in a similar situation, and thankfully that seemed to be a good enough answer for them. Before I was allowed to return to Earth, they made me sign a non-disclosure agreement again, and also gave me a good severance package, 
considering I'd just saved the entire human race as well as everything else on Earth. I saw Judy and Damien one more time before leaving. I decided to mention Damien's crush on Judy, just to stir the pot a little and make sure he didn't chicken out this time around. But, well, I was home again. Sadly speaking, upon returning to Earth, I found myself a little more edgy every day. I decided that I should get a job with solar panels, thinking that this could be an ironic choice and a safer way to harness the sun's energy. But I can't stop thinking about what I did all the time. It's always hanging above my head, reminding me of what I can do. I was under constant stress. I looked at my family and kept thinking that they're all really just ghosts. They're dead in my timeline, and yet they're still alive. I don't know how to think about it in any other way. God, I feel like I'm losing my grip on reality. Fearful every time I watch TV and there's an obelisk on there. I find myself slipping further and further away from my own sanity. Everything about this place now reminds me of that I don't belong here anymore. I experience so much, and to see all of it deleted out of existence makes me wish that I was gone with it. I wish I was with my original family. I wish I was with my original friends back on the original moon base. Jeez, I'm losing it. After reading my grandfather's journal, I don't know what else to say. It almost seems like the mad ramblings of a man who had just lost his mind. But at the same time, things are a little too aligned. He was an astronaut. He did go away for months. And when he came back, he initially tried to make it look like nothing had changed, but slowly became distant from everyone. And if what he says is true, that means there's something insanely destructive that's constantly hanging over our heads. I'm not going to let what happened to my dad mess me up either. There's always something dangerous that could destroy humanity anyway, so I guess this one piece of advice will always do us good. Just don't think about it. Well, my thanks to author James Caligo for that incredible story. Well, that certainly gives you a lot to think about, doesn't it? What would you do in that situation? How would you feel afterwards? Uh, the uh, protagonist was kind of messed up at the end, and I think I would be in almost exactly the same way. Well, maybe just don't think about it is the best way to get through it. Who knows? Well, that's your Thursday evening's entertainment. Uh, there'll be a podcast tomorrow night, and I'll be back here again at the weekend, probably on Saturday night this time. You ready for that? Maybe do one of those midnight specials again for all of you in the United States. Well, enough for this evening. Till the next time, my dear friends. Have a very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.